All right. Well, welcome to the end of this thing. It's been quite a journey for me. I've actually been recording all day, probably about 10 hours, maybe more. I don't even know. So it's been quite a ride. I hope that's been a quite a ride for you too as well. This is the epilogue. This is the summary. So my goal is to summarize the main points from each part here to give you a little more um, clarity. If you skipped, then no Fennec Fox points for you. Make sure you go watch those previous sections and really edify yourself because this is so important, folks. This is so important. You need to learn the truth. If you watch all the way through, then congratulations. Your ears have gotten, hopefully, much larger and you have been able to sniff out a lot more things than before. So I hope it's been edifying for you. I hope you've learned quite a lot. Before I summarize, a few points that are important. God is one consistent truth. Through and through, Old Testament and New Testament, he's one consistent truth. The devil always makes a counterfeit, and because God is one consistent truth, he has to do, the devil has to do a counterfeit of mosaic, he has to do a mosaic of lies. God is one truth, the devil is a mosaic of lies. So unless you see the bigger picture, it's very easy to get lost in the weeds of the mosaic that the devil's created in history. It's kind of like zooming into a mosaic. You can't really tell left or right unless you zoom out and you see how all these things are, are created. For example, people say, oh, it's the Jews. It's the New World Order globalists. It's the Zionists. It's the Christian nationalists. Well, sort of kind, it's all of the above. And who is steering that toward the One World Order? Well, the Bible tells you. That's why I said you don't need to spend hours and hours you know, learning about secret societies. The Bible tells you, my friends, it points you to the head of the snake where all these things are converging so that you know what to watch. But you need to use the Bible and you need to develop technique in reading the Bible because most people don't. You need to think outside the box. Don't get stuck in these distractions because there's going to be more and more as time comes on, goes on. The Bible warns you the Catholic Church. It says she's the mother of abominations, the mother of harlots, and hopefully you see that now very clearly. Now, another important thing is on synergism. And I mentioned this, and I'll mention it again. Synergism is the notion that salvation is accomplished by cooperating between you and God. Every religion in, in history is synergistic to some degree because synergism is part of the forbidden fruit. If you have to contribute to the outcome, then it depends on you. Do you get it? The God is waiting on us to do something so that he can return and, and basically usher in the millennial kingdom. The Jews believe that. The Christian nationalists believe that. The New Agers believe that. Everybody believes these things because the forbidden fruit has infected all of humanity. The gospel alone is what tells you the truth, and the truth is monergistic. God has predetermined reality for his glory. There's nothing you can do to affect that. God will be glorified. Judaism, Islam, Catholicism, Christian nationalism, the NAR, the charismatic movement, the occult, all of these that I just listed are synergistic. Part of the reason people are deceived is because they reject monergism. They reject a completely sovereign God that predestined reality to reveal his glory. The good and the bad will reveal God's glory. And if you don't understand that, then I encourage you and lovingly invite you to meditate on what the Bible actually has to say on predestination and on the monergistic work of God. Because it's very important because you can get snared into these false theologies if you are a hardcore synergist. Now, this is a controversial topic, but that alone should be an indicator that it's the truth. The world doesn't like these things, and everything that the world hates is something that we should look more into. Most of the world is synergistic, and when I say most, I mean like probably 99%. Therefore, it falls right into the trap that we have to do something for God to react. We have to bring about this millennial reign. This ideology unites people to set the stage for the Antichrist kingdom, which is what the Bible warns you about. That's part of the great delusion, folks. People are so deceived that they can bring about the return of Christ that they will bring about, actually, they're going to fall into the deception of the devil and bring about an age of worshiping the devil. 
In a reality where there are predetermined outcomes for the highest good, there is nothing to fear. There's nothing to change. God has made the best decisions ahead of time, and they are playing out, and you are participating in those decisions. The devil will be worshipped. God has decreed it, meaning that voting, striving, doing anything, converting, you know, converting the Jews, whatever, none of this stuff is relevant to God's plan. You cannot force the clock, whether make it later or earlier or whatever else. To believe that means you don't believe in a sovereign God. It means that you have more power than God. And of course, that's why this is all satanic. This is the final test to split the true church from the counterfeit church. This is it, the great delusion. Satan will integrate his counterfeit church into one body through the mark of the beast. That counterfeit church is the mystery religion of the ages. And because we're in the final times, John and God through John has revealed to you that Satan has chosen his vehicle for how this integration will happen, which is the Catholic Church. And it will be integrated. Those who are elect and true will leave Mystery Babylon. They will be saved. But part of leaving is getting your theology right and learning how to use the sort of truth. You need to abandon synergistic salvation, free will salvation, and embrace a monergistic gospel. You need to abandon Jewish end times views and embrace the church as the center of Bible prophecy, which points you to the true Antichrist power. You need to abandon heliocentrism because it comes with all sorts of lies and embrace what God has created, which is a beautiful cosmology for him and his creation. You need to abandon the idea of a separate immortal soul that is persisting after death. And of course, all of that is tied to new age and charismatic worship and all these types of things. Paganism, it's all part of the same forbidden fruit. You need to abandon that the nature of the church is an institution or a denomination, but rather it is based on the elect believers who are predestined in Christ and who the Father gives to Jesus and Jesus cannot lose. That is the true church because that true church will be separated from the counterfeit church through these trials and tribulations in the mark of the beast. The great delusion is decreed by God to separate the elect from the non-elect. And you have to understand that. The Trinity is also important, being right on that and not rejecting what the Bible teaches about the plurality of God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And of course, last but not least, the Sabbath you need to get out of this Sunday keeping, the weekend, all of these subtle subversions to make you think that Sunday is the day you need to rest on, because very soon that's going to be an issue. And again, I talk about it in my End Times series, The Mark of the Beast. I talk about my Sabbath series, extremely well documented, folks. If you doubt it, just give the evidence a shot. If you think I sound crazy, go and look at the evidence for crying out loud. Base your beliefs on evidence and realize that the snake moves through history, up and down, dark and light, wave upon wave, and the wave is coming. Just like there was a wave of Sunday legalization, and then 150 years later, suddenly the Jews were thrown under the bus, or I should say the Christians were thrown under the bus who were Sabbath keepers, and don't be like the Jews... There's going to come a time when the Jews are finally converted. The problem is solved. No more Jews to stand in the way between the beast and the Sabbath-keeping Christians. Once the Jews are out of the way, then you're going to be prime target for, for all of the propaganda that I showed you in these various videos. That's going to be aimed at you and me, and you need to be ready for that reality. So watch my series, see my statement of faith, Know what the narrow road employs. My goal is to walk the narrow road as much as possible. I don't claim to have perfect theology, but my effort in life and in what I do is to walk the narrow road and to avoid imbalances. And the things that I've just listed off to you are the major lies that I've personally realized in my journey and that God has shown me through study and rigorous research. Hopefully you can appreciate the research that I've put into the things that I do. And God has shown me quite a lot of things. I really give glory to God because a lot of this stuff just comes to my doorstep. But nonetheless, these are the seven pillars, the major pillars 
that I've seen that Mystery Babylon has deceived people on, and it will require you to exit these worldviews in order to escape the coming, you know, whatever, integration. Because one way or another, it makes you susceptible to that integration if you believe in those things. I'm not saying you have to believe those things to be saved. I'm saying make sure you walk the narrow road so you aren't deceived. Faith in Christ is what saves you, obviously. That's what the gospel teaches. But we are in a unique situation, folks. We're at the end of history. And that time comes with unique circumstances. Uh, uh, particular circumstances that the devil will be worshipped and people were, are going to wander after the beast. So everything that's associated to the beast, you need to get rid of it. Revelation 18.4 says, get out of her, my people. That means get out of this worldview so that you have no temptation to be integrated to it. Okay, so now, after that, let's do a review of all these different parts. So starting with part one, that was current events, we looked at how Christian Zionism has gone into a new phase, thanks to the NAR movement. The charismatic movement has taken over and fused conservatives with Christian nationalism and Christian Zionism into one movement. NAR is changing dispensationalism from passive to aggressive. It's from waiting on the Jews to colonize Israel to we need to convert the Jews in order to bring Jesus back. This has now been growing and shifting for the last 20 years, and now it's reaching ahead, especially with the timing of Zionism being exposed and the Third Temple being rebuilt and yada, yada. Everything is being timed very, very well. Now, in part two, we looked at the Jesuit end times conspiracy. We looked at how futurism's main components were created by Jesuits Manuel Lacunza, Robert Bellarmine, and Francisco Ribera. Each added their own spin to it, and all of them got the attention off the Pope as the Antichrist. It was all part of the Counter-Reformation to discredit the Protestants. Preter preterism was also given life by Luis de Alcazar, who was a Jesuit. And Manuel Lacunza's book made its way, who, by the way, who wrote under a Jewish pen name to hide his identity, which should tell you everything about what the papacy thinks of the Jews, they, the book made its way into England, and it was translated by Edward Irving, who was a dispensationalist and also the kind of father of Pentecostalism, sort of. He really contributed to that movement. movement. So all of these things intersected with the Jesuits, and the dispensationalists in England. Now, in part three, we looked at the history of dispensationalism, and we kind of drilled down into Darby and Irving having to belong in this Plymouth Brethren thing, where all of these ideas, it was just a mishmash of just satanic stuff, man. Occult, Pentecostalism, Kundalini spirit, false Antichrist spirit, mixing with false Jesuit theology, and ultimately, this new thing was born. Darby went to America several times, and his ideas influenced lots of people. Schofield was also a key player that was recruited, very likely a Jesuit or Freemason operative. And the Schofield Bible saved dispensationalism and became a hit. It had like millions of copies. Meanwhile, the Millerites, the Adventists, the forerunners of Adventism, failed in their prediction to believe that Christ was going to come in 1844, and that discredited historicism and basically launched dispensationalism into great new heights. There was also increasing false signs and wonders throughout that time, like the Pentecostal revivals, the, the healing movements. Then you had Hollywood, like TBN, CBN, Left Behind series. All of these things over the last hundred years made this part of everyday American thinking. So ingrained in people's thought generationally to where there is... Almost an it's almost impossible to argue with a dispensationalist because it's all in ingrained in their generational thinking. <coughs> Excuse me. Part four, we looked at the occult connection between these people. We looked at how Darby's family was associated with the occult. Darby's family lived in a haunted castle. He claimed to speak to spirits. His sister-in-law summoned an elemental, dabbled in witchcraft, probably others in his family as well. There's a lot of evidence in Darby's writings that, that he was influenced by New Age and occult ideas, which were rampant during his time. So there's very good reason to believe that this is the case. 
There's a lot of Freemason occult connections to Schofield and the Dallas Theological Seminary. The, Ply the Plymouth Brethren, where all these people met, is also home to the family of Aleister Crowley, who was a famous Satanist, did a lot of very dubious things, and just a lot of dubious, strange things about these people, which ultimately connects them to the occult. Now, in part five, we looked at the Pentecostal connection. We took a biblical look first at why Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement are unbiblical. In fact, they're in, an inversion of the truth, so it, it's a signature of Satan's handiwork that's in, inverting the truth. The three pillars they're based on are easily refuted with scripture. The first pillar being that real languages were spoken, not gibberish. The second pillar is that Joel 2 was fulfilled in Acts. It's not a future prophecy. There's no revival at the end times. And of course, the third pillar is that the Bible says history is getting worse before the return of Christ. It's not getting better, which is what charismatics are relying on, because they have to invert the truth in order to justify their position. We also looked at the history of the charismatic experience as a kundalini false spirit with roots in the occult, Gnosticism, ancient, you know, occult practices. There's no difference between the kundalini snake spirit and the charismatic experiences these people are having. There really isn't. And you saw that video. Uh, again, if you skip to this summary, go watch those previous sections. You'll see what I'm talking about. Now, in part six, we looked at the evolution of the NAR specifically in, in you know the last hundred years or so. And that came out of Pentecostalism, which created charismatic movement, which created various movements. And NAR is kind of the crowning achievement of all these things. The, NA, the NAR evolved out of many waves, waves of Pentecostalism. And slowly things became more politicized, fusing together various things into one ideal. The NAR, through charismatic experiences, infiltrated Christian Zionism and Christian conservatives. Through seduction, it took over through all these charismatic experiences. Now it's repositioning dispensationalism for the final apostasy. It's very important to understand that part of this repositioning is the Messianic movement, where they got these Messianic Jews to be early adopters to the new thing, and they're going to use them as evidence for the atheistic liberal Jews that need to go from dark to light. And they're using them at the NAR rallies. Now, part seven, we looked at how the beast is involved in the charismatic movement. We looked at how the Catholic churches basically had an active role, especially in the last hundred years, in the charismatic movement, embraces it, loves the Pentecostalism. Since the 1960s with Vatican II, Everything was repositioned towards a false light system, seduction, brotherhood, ecumenism, you know, counterfeit spirit type of angle. Satan's chosen vehicle is the Catholic Church. You have to remember that, where all of these things will be integrated. Jesuit operatives like Catherine Kuhlman started the faith healing movement, which eventually led to people like Benny Hinn, the prosperity movement, which eventually led to the NAR movement. Satan does these in waves. Okay, you got to remember that. And if you understand these waves and you understand history, you can be much more alert to what is happening. And of course, the popes are very happy about the charismatic movement, which should tell you everything. Now, in part eight, we looked at the Islamic connection. Here we reviewed the history of Islam in general. And again, if you want more, just watch my episode 21 of the End Times series how it was created, and how basically the beast used Islam for its own purposes. And of course, it will be used in the latter days as well. We looked at how there's various angles being used to prep the Muslims for a worldwide conversion. That is ecumenism. We looked at all those ecumenical things going on. We looked at secret societies and the occult connection. And we looked at cultural espionage through people like Andrew Tate, who are basically priming culture to, to go through these various dialectics to, to flip from dark to light. Islam is also intertwined with Zionism by design so that the conflict that will happen in the Middle East will lead to a synthesis. Islam is primed to go from dark to light. It just needs a supernatural experience of some kind. This is what it's all leading to, folks. This is part of the great delusion. False signs and wonders by the activity and power of Satan 
is all of these things coming? You have to understand that what is coming is boiling down to some sort of supernatural situation. Now, for the Muslims, the, the, the Dajjal, the Antichrist, the personal Antichrist, is the Jewish Messiah, which the Jews are ready to bring forward very soon. Do you see how all this plays together? Muslims also believe Jesus will return, and they believe Fatima appearances were real, meaning they they understand that Mary appeared to these people in Portugal or whatever. And so there is definitely a base there for the supernatural to happen and to catalyze the already existing base of ecumenism, secret societies, the culture of espionage, everything I talked about. They just need a supernatural event. The Third Temple will provide that. And once that happens, the Muslims will become the thing that the Pope wanted 1,400 years ago, which is an army for the Pope against the Sabbath-keeping Christians. That will be fulfilled at the end times. The Muslims will convert. Fanatical Muslims will bring all of that fanatical generation, generational anger and blood into Christian, nationalist, militant, new thing. And anybody who stands against this new thing, you're just a heretic and you need to be, well, ostracized. Let's put it that way. It's going to happen, folks. The Bible predicted it. Now, in the final part, which was Zionism and the Third Temple, we looked at how all of these things are, are coming together with the Third Temple. The Jews were used for many reasons by the beast. They were used as scapegoats for all the dirty deeds that the beast did. Politics, proxies, banking. They were used to create a false prophecy so they can basically deceive the Christians back into the mother church. They were used to create a false prophecy to deceive the Muslims back into conversion. They were used to justify endless wars in the Middle East so that the false prophet, which is the United States, could be kept strong through the petrodollar. They were used to unify evangelicals under Christian nationalism. Remember, again, first phase and second phase Zionism through Christian Zionism, first phase, and then second phase with the NAR, which is unifying all these things. And of course, the last part of the Jews, which is so important, so very valuable to the papacy, is that they will be used, their conversion will be used to condemn Sabbath keepers and enact the final leg of the Mark of the Beast persecutions. Do you get it? The Mark of the Beast is not going to start with don't rest on Saturday. The Mark of the Beast is going to start with it's good to rest on Sunday. And when everybody adopts that, the next and final phase is to persecute the Bible-believing Christians, because that's what the Bible tells you is going to happen. Now, of course, there'll be some left alive, so the moment that that happens, we know that the time is extremely near, because the bold judgments will start very shortly, because some people need to be left alive. But nonetheless, this is the phase, and the justification they will have is the fact that the very last people keeping the Saturday Sabbath, which are the Jews, even though they keep it from sun, sundown, which is wrong, but they keep it Saturday. Those people converted and they've accepted the Messiah. You're rejecting the Messiah. You're rejecting the day of resurrection. You're rejecting this new thing. So you need to be punished as a heretic. Don't Judaize. Otherwise, you will be shut out from Christ. Do you understand how all of these things fall together? It's really phenomenal. Truly phenomenal. But nonetheless, that's what the Jews are going to be used for in their final purpose. The third temple dialectic will lead to some sort of supernatural climax. Either Lucifer is going to masquerade as Christ, there's going to be a false Armageddon, false millennial reign, that's a possibility. Or there's a supernatural or hologram type of sign that happens, either through Mary or Jesus or who knows, some sort of thing that will facilitate a conversion of sorts. Or war will lead to peace, which will promote a charismatic revival in the Middle East through all the things that we talked about today. So some combination of those, maybe, who knows. But we will have to watch as time goes on because we know the Jews will be integrated and so will the Muslims. And it hinges on this third temple dialectic. Of course, the Christian Zionists and the NAR also hinge on this false prophecy. So this is the fulcrum of the great delusion. Again, remember, fanatical converted Muslims are going to do the papacy's bidding against the Sabbath keepers. Imagine how much the Muslims hate the Jews right now. 
And once the Jews convert and the Muslims convert and everybody has world peace and you're insisting that you need to rest on the seventh day, imagine how many people are going to hate you. Imagine where you're going to have this false peace where Muslims and Jews are all together under the Catholic system. I know it sounds so crazy, doesn't it, folks? But this is the way history is unfolding, and this is what the Bible warned us about. Imagine brothers in arms, Muslims and Jews, finally come together under this false Christ, under this false Christian reality. They embrace Sunday, and you are the heretic that wants to cling to old ways? What is wrong with you? Don't Judaize. All that hatred that the Muslims had for Jews is going to be directed at you. All the hatred that the Jews had for their own ways are going to be directed at you. All the hatred that the Christian nationalists have towards the Jews are going to be directed at you. Do you get the point? You're, you're the last bastion. But you, the beast can't get to you just yet. It needs to get there layer by layer. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And that final layer is the Jewish conversion and the Muslim conversion, which is going to happen simultaneously, probably, because they're inextricably tied to one another. So, final thoughts. My goodness, I thank the Lord Jesus that he's given me strength to speak. I don't know, 10 hours that I've been talking. My voice is still recovering, folks. I give glory to God that God has helped me recover my voice. In 2022, I lost my voice for nine months. And it's been a painful journey since then. It's been... Good, I've recovered mostly 80%, but I am just grateful to God that I've been able to speak to you. Obviously, you can tell the lighting is different. I've been talking in front of a camera since 10 in the morning, and now it's you know, almost 8 o'clock at night. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me strength to convey this important message. No matter how much you study these things, they're not going to be 100% clear until they are very close to fulfilling. Remember Daniel in chapter 9, he recognizes that the time is near for the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy of the 70 years. So he prays to God and Gabriel comes and gives him clarity. But he recognized that the time was near. And this is the same thing. We need to stay watchful. God wants us to be vigilant. That's why I use this cute little fennec fox with the ears, because ultimately it's a great reminder. It's a cute reminder, but it's funny and very relevant. You need to have huge ears, folks. That fox's ears are totally disproportionate to the rest of his body. But that's on point. You need to have incredible discernment if you want to escape the great delusion. If you haven't learned the truth about the Sabbath and the Mark of the Beast, watch my Sabbath series, please. Please watch it. Watch the timeline to the end, because that is also an extremely important bird's eye view. In this one, we went really in-depth on a particular topic, which is this great delusion. The timeline to the end gives you an idea of what to watch, what is the sequence of things, and organizes the time from now until the end of Christ in a very biblically-based and clean way, so that you understand what not to be deceived by, what to watch in the news, and what not to watch. So that's a very important episode. There's going to be many distractions, like the Andrew Tate and Marmari controversy, which is not really a controversy. But these types of things are going to be more and more in the limelight, in the culture, to distract you. Uh, oh my gosh, there's this, there's that, there's a, oh, 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 and so you don't see what's happening. You have to stay focused on the Mark of the Beast, what's happening with that, this whole charismatic revival, the Third Temple, and understand where all of this is going, which again, the mark of the beast is the indicator that you need to watch the most. And if you don't know what the mark of the beast is, which of course the beast has done a great job of hiding it and deceiving people, then you cannot be prepared for what is to come. Do you get the point? Share this information with others that you care about, study it, learn it, commit it to memory. Again, not you have to memorize everything here, but understand the bigger picture, folks. Understand where this is going. I'm going to post the references on my website. If you want references for each part, I will post the links. All those cool websites about the occult connections of dispensationalism and so on, they're all going to be really good to reference for your own things if you want. But again, look, once the third temple is being built, 
it's going to take an act of God to wake people up from dispensationalism. It's not, I can't even call it dispensationalism anymore. Do you understand? It's not dispensationalism. This is the new thing. This is the great delusion. But we remember that the elect will be sealed. God will save who he has purpose to save. And there's nothing that can change that. I don't know who those people are, neither do you. That's why we have to just do our best until we can't anymore. And that will be measured by the mark of the beast. Once they start passing anti-Sabbath laws, and you see anti-Sabbath propaganda, that's your sign that the sealing of the elect is coming to an end. Because there has to be a point in time when the elect has reached his fullness, the 144,000. And at that point, shortly after, the bold judgments will drop on all the people who decided to take the mark. And of course, you you can't decide it free will. It's people who are not elect who took the mark. That was a choice they made, but they couldn't have made any other choice because God did not give them awareness supernaturally. So you have to watch the mark and you have to get familiar with history and the precedents and things like Sunday laws and Sunday law legislations in the news. You have to be aware of that because that's going to be an increasingly more important thing to have your finger on the pulse in the coming months and years. So learn the truth, stay informed. Remember to have peace about all of this because it doesn't, look, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It, it's not anything to worry about. It really isn't. I mean, it is scary. It's crazy. But at the same time, it proves that God is sovereign, doesn't it? This evil that is happening, that God has told you about, in so many prophecies, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 13, Revelation 17, he has told you about the great delusion. And the fact that you're living to see it reveals that God is sovereign over the evil. And do you understand the good news? That as this thing gets more and more evil, we get more and more hope because he is coming nearer. So this is the good news, and you have to remind yourself that because it's easy to get lost in all of the stuff that is happening. One final thing I'll leave you with is this. Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. Martha and Mary. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but there is one thing that is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Such an important lesson here. First one being that do not be anxious about things that don't matter. Learn what to watch learn what to focus on, and learn what is not important, not worth your emotions. Do not be like Martha. Don't let these things distract you. Focus on Christ. Focus on your practice. Focus on your prayer. Develop your habit of daily prayer. Learn the truth. Learn to study the Bible, to use proper hermeneutics. Practice the Sabbath. Get out of this institutionalized worldview with all of the different pillars that I just mentioned before. Take care of your health. Make sure you're strong and functional, independent, healthy, strong, mentally, both physically and mentally. Learn to give glory to God every day. And remember that Jesus can't lose anybody who the Father has given to him. The, the What does he say at the end? Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. He will not be taken away from you because nobody who is given to Christ can be lost. That is the will of the Father for Christ. Christ cannot disobey the will of the Father. And that is good news, my friends. That is great news, because regardless of what happens, the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance with Christ. And you have to remind yourself, regardless of what happens. I have outlined for you many crazy things that I don't think anybody on the internet is integrating. I really don't. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. I'm really not. I just don't think anybody sees this bigger picture just yet. Maybe they will as time goes on, but my goal is to get this out as soon as possible so that you can be one of the early birds. But nonetheless, at the time of this video, I haven't found anybody to integrate all these things. And the point is that I've shared with you things that are very scary, 
they're very bleak and they're they're scary the reality that this is happening however you have to remind yourself of the gospel you have to remember and a great verse for that is Ephesians 1 verse 13 through 14 in him you also when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him we're sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Amen. So I'm going to leave you with that. There are probably at least three other places in my knowledge in the Bible where it says that the Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. God wants you to know what is going to happen. Of course, we're not going to know everything, so that's why we have to develop a history with current events and history and you know, a habit of watching history and, and God's word in one hand and history in the other to have an intimate relationship with God and his word. But nonetheless, he's given you what's going to happen. And he's also giving, he gives you the bad news and he gives you the good news. That The prophecies are always like this. Here's the bad news. Here's what needs to happen. But here's the good news. The gospel is going to be triumphant. The 144,000 will be sealed, meaning the elect that need to come to Christ will come and be saved. You can be more sure than the rising of the sun on that. So if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, confirm your election and realize that the spirit that is working through you is God's guarantee that you will see Jesus and not be condemned. So with that, I leave you. God bless you. Stay strong and cling close to the Lord.